Thank you for joining us for our program at Mechanics Institute Online for Divine Madness, a novel by Lynn Kaufman. Lynn will be in conversation with poets, with poets Allison Lutterman and David Watts. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. And tonight we are proud to co-sponsor our program with the Fromm Institute for Lifelong Learning. For those of you who are new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we are one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library on the second and third floor, an international chess club renowned to all, and our ongoing literary programs and author events and the Friday night cinema lit film series. So please see us online at milibrary.org and also visit the website and also come down for a tour of our incredibly beautiful uh, Beaux-Arts building. Uh, there are both virtual tours and live tours on Wednesday and you can find that information on our website. This talk will be followed by a Q&A with you, the audience. And we'd like to mention that books will be on sale. And if you'd like to purchase a book, uh, we'll put Lynn Kaufman's email in the chat and you can be in touch with her directly. So I'd like to introduce our program, Divine Madness. Cal is Robert Lowell, the sixth poet laureate of the United States. And Lizzie is Elizabeth Hardwick, a writer and critic whose true life partnership with Lowell was marked by his mental illness and desertion. Yet award-winning playwright Lynn Kaufman's spare poetic novel is far deeper, much deeper than a harrowing account of a famously unhappy marriage. The fictional manuscript touches on Lizzie's friendships with Mary McCarthy and Hannah Arendt, her memoirs of the civil rights movement and her Southern childhood and more. In this novel, Kaufman has composed an intriguing elegy combining fiction, reality, and writerly personas. And now a little bit about our speakers. Lynn Kaufman is the author of 20 full-length prize-winning plays produced nationally at such venues at the, as the Magic Theater, Actors Theater of Louisville, Theater Works Silicon Valley, the Fountain Theater in Los Angeles, and the Abington Theater in New York City. Most recently, she has three plays produced at the, at the Marsh Theater, including Acid Test, Two Minds, and Who Killed Sylvia Plath. Her solo play, Who Killed Sylvia Plath, starring Lori Holt, had a six week, week run at both the Marsh in San Francisco and also the Marsh in Berkeley. And it's a wonderful show. It also won first place in best show of the Marsh's International Solo Play Festival. She also teaches at the Fromm Institute and also at Ali San Francisco Stage. Alison Lutterman's four books of poetry are the, the Largest Possible Life, See How We Almost Fly, Desire Zoo, and In the Time of Great Fires. Her poems and stories have appeared in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, The Sun, Rattle, Nimrod, Salon, Prairie Schooner, The Brooklyn Review, The Atlanta Review, Tattoo Highway, and also in numerous journals and anthologies. She has written an ebook of personal essays, half a dozen plays, lyrics for a song cycle, We Are Not Afraid of the Dark, and is currently working on two different musical theater projects. And David Watts' is, literary cr credits include seven books of poetry, three collections of short stories, two mystery novels, eight Western novels, a Christmas memoir, and some essays on humanism in medicine. He is a physician, a classically trained musician, and a past national radio TV personality. 
He is currently teaching the allure of haiku at the Fromm Institute, where he has taught poetry for over 35 years. So please welcome our guests, our, uh, our guests of many letters and genres. Welcome to Lynn, David, and Allison. It's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you. And thanks Thank you. so much for putting on this event, which uh, looks to be very interesting. And uh, so, Lynn, I think you and I are to gauge in a little bit of conversation. And uh, obviously, it's over this wonderful book that you have written. I must say, I didn't know what to expect when reading the book. I was delighted uh, immediately by the style of your writing, the crispness as you approached your topic, the literary references that you gave along the way. It's a very elegant, uh, interesting, uh, quirkily written uh, diary-esque book that I must say I enjoyed greatly. My first question to you is, what is it that attracted you to this particular subject? To the subject? Um, I wrote a play about Sylvia Plath, which uh, Laura mentioned, and did a lot of, why was I drawn to Sylvia Plath? Because incredibly iconic, uh, you know, the troubled writer who, and she took her own life at the age of 30. And um, I was intrigued by I guess by her life and by the fact that when she was in crisis, when her husband left her and you know, she had two babies to take care of, that's when she wrote her best poetry. And so, you know, in extremis, I was drawn to Sylvia, investigated all that. We did it as a play. And then as I was researching, I read that Sylvia Plath had taken a poetry class with Robert Lowell uh, at the, the same time Anne Sexton was taking it. And the three of them, Robert Lowell, Sylvia, and Anne shared this kind of mm, manic depressive bipolar um, illness and used it to inform their poetry. And so, you know, way leads to way, I started reading about Robert Lowell. And through reading about him, I discovered uh, Elizabeth Hardwick. She's not nearly as well known um, as Lowell. And I got deeply interested in her. And I wrote a short play called Divine Madness about Lowell and Hardwick. And we did that on Zoom. 35 minutes, and I wasn't ready to leave, particularly Elizabeth Hardwick. Uh, and so I, I wrote this novel. I wanted her, she was so discreet. Lowell was all over the place, telling, you know, revealing everything about his marriage and leaving his wife for the other woman in the dolphin. And Elizabeth kept her own peace about it. And I wanted, wanted to hear what Elizabeth really felt during this period of time. And I wanted to know her as a writer. She's an exquisite writer. And so that's, and then the only other thing I was going to add to that is this wonderful quote from uh, Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream. It's the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are all of imagination, are our imagination all compact. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet. And um, this, the lover certainly was Elizabeth. She loved him from the time she met him through, through his early deaths, never forgot him. So, and the lunatic and the poet, yeah, you could say in a sense that was Robert Lowell. Yeah, it looks like all three of those are present in <laughs> Robert Lowell. And it's interesting that all three of those that you mentioned that were in this tight group, uh, very highly productive 
poets and writers at that time had a little bit of something going on in their uh, cerebral space that wasn't quite what the rest of the society would expect as normal. And it sort of brings up, I think you touched on this subject somewhere along the way, is contentment the, en the enemy of the poet? Does one have to be in an uncontented state in order to reach into the depths of the consciousness and come up with creativity? What do you think? Well, if I were really content, I wouldn't write. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think I would uh, because it calls up so much stuff, you know? So I think a sense of contentment, I would, I would think I would not be as obsessed with um, having to express what's going on inside. Um, and, and you and Allison, of course, you're incredibly prolific and, uh, and poets. I don't write poetry, but I honestly, there's no other way to know how I really feel about something uh, using both you know, the analytic and the intuitive and, and what's going on around me. Um, except, you know, for writing, it seemed to me if I were content, I would just want to watch um, uh, um, series on TV, you know, which I'm watching anyway, you know, during during COVID. And um, yeah, and be, be out in nature. I mean, it, it's a wonderful thing to, to write, but it's also torturous. So no, I, I think, well, the big issue is, is and we'll come to that maybe when uh, in the discussion afterwards about the really um, excessive uh, mood swings that certain poets have. And I've only read about this, but I know a little, I felt a little bit of it um, when uh, suddenly you're in an altered state and, you, and that can be reached I guess mentally or by anguish, you know, it can be reached by drugs, by alcohol. So many writers have used those right. those substances to sort of get out of the ordinary, or as you just called it, the content. You know. Well, you so. know, it's interesting because, and I did a little study of this. Um, if you look at the personalities of different writers, um, you will find that both playwrights and poets end up with the personality most likely to have depression and anxiety. Not to say that all of us do, but it's an interesting observation. And it makes me think about, I, I did a little study of brain functions uh, on my own self in the process of writing, trying to access the unconscious where I believe a lot of the creativity comes. Mm. You have to shut down your daytime mode of thinking in order to get into the unconscious mode and that requires shaking off that sort of linear mathematical uh, approach of daytime living where we go from one thing to another, we have a schedule, we balance our checkbook, all that sort of thing. Yeah. It's run by a portion of the brain that is, has a sort of a sergeant major kind of attitude toward getting things done, but it's humorless and it's not creative. <laughs> and so, yeah. To get creative, one has to shut down that brain and open up the other side, which gets into what's called the default network, more deeply connected with the deeper levels of consciousness. Absolutely. And I, and yeah. I think that they who have so-called disorders, psychiatric disorders, move in and out of those zones with deafness from time to time. Absolutely. It's interesting that you put playwrights and poets together. I'm basically a playwright. I've done much more work in the theater than, than I have. In fact, I, I did three novels before, which were pretty traditional novels that were published. That was about oh, in 2004, 2005, I stopped writing novels. And it was only the fact that this play so drew me and that 
the form of the novel is very unconventional. You know, it's not a traditional novel at all. And when you mention, you know, it's fragments, fragments, moments uh, in, in uh, their lives, in their shared lives. And I'm wondering if plays too are not, they're not linear narratives, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, like many, there are novels that are more experimental and not linear, mood, dreamlike, and, you know, but they're not many. Most of them are, um, are narrative and, and sort of uh, move forward in a, in a logical time, logical, traditional thought. So it's interesting, David, because I hadn't heard the two together. I knew it about poets. Yeah. But I yeah. didn't know. I wish I knew that before. Maybe I would have just written novels. <laughs> <laughs> so I noticed that your style of writing was very interesting. Um, you you mentioned the word fragments a minute ago. You have chapters that are three lines long, and then you have chapters that run for two or three pages. So um, it has a very spontaneous feel to it, a very almost associative thinking process that moves through from vignette to vignette to vignette and I finally caught on to the fact that you were sort of doing this like a diary but I think it also brings up that issue of form and content right mm -hmm. we we say in poetry that the form has to match the content so if the content indicates a certain style of writing it changes your way in which you approach it not just in terms of the way you address the topic but the form that you put it on the page yes you, do you think that's right? I do, and I attribute, I mean, that's how I wrote it mostly, and I attribute the layout to my publisher, uh, who is a, a kind of extraordinary. Uh, she runs the press called uh, Tailwinds Press. She's also a, a Wall Street, Yale-educated lawyer, so she works out of both, you know, both sides of her brain. And she laid out the, the text. And in fact, there's one moment where I did not do this, but it works beautifully. Um, there, uh, Elizabeth in the novel is haranguing, she's very angry at Cal, at Robert Lowell, for using her letters, her personal anguished letters during the divorce that he yep. just lifted them, paraphrased them, put them in this book of poetry called The Dolphin and won a Pulitzer Prize for it. And, you know, and then so he's having this dialogue with her and he says, uh, you know, uh, if I had asked you, you should have asked me. She said, you should have asked me before you used the." And he said, well, if I had asked you, would you have said yes? And yep. then Sarang, my my publisher made a whole new chapter that just says Lizzie and it says of course not <laughs> so this is you know it almost has this sense of of a play and um I guess yeah yeah that that I hadn't thought of it as poetry but uh, you know the the connection between the way a poem sits on the page yeah it does feel like poetry actually it I wanted to also to talk about the relationship between these two. It's a fascinating relationship. Cal did everything wrong. You know, he betrayed her, he had fares, he ran off, he went, came back, he got crazy, he became violent, he opted, he co-opted her letters and turned them into a Pulitzer Prize winning collection. Um, and yet she stuck with him. And then you figure, what in heaven's name? allowed her to put up with that kind of behavior. She got to where she could actually notice the beginnings of his falling apart, right? He would right. become a little more animated. He'd become a little bit more the way in which he spoke. His pace picked up and pretty soon he was having to get electroshock therapy again. Right. Time and time again, she was there. Time and time again, she came back to him. And at the end, you have her say, he was the best thing that happened in my life. Yeah. How is that possible? How is it? That was the question I went into writing. That was what motivated the book, truly. 
you asked what began it, what began it was the research on the poetry cycle with Sylvia Plath. And, but what pursued me through it is because particularly today in the Me Too time and feminism, uh, we have to think of her time too, when they were together and, and uh, you know, they met in the 50s. And the 50s was still fairly conventional and uh, he died He died in uh, late 70s. I think for Elizabeth, and, and it was never all the time, but what she says, his is still the most interesting mind yeah. of anyone I've ever met. She saw him as a genius and um, respected that. And, uh, you know, so just the other day, someone said, I have a long marriage. It's gone on one marriage for a very long time, still going. And somebody said, well, how did you, you know, how do you stay married? You know, how do you think? And I just, it's the family, you don't leave. <laughs> and, you know, it's as That's simple as that. How to, That's how to, how to avoid divorce. You don't leave. <laughs> you don't leave. Yeah. You just don't leave. And she, did, she finally gave him the divorce she'd gone through. You're right. His craziness with other women. But it was always, he would come back. And it was always in the middle of this mania. Not only would he come back, she entertained Caroline, his next wife. Yes. And brought her in. And around the time of the funeral, Caroline actually stayed in the house with her. Absolutely. So there's that love, hate, hot, cold, black, white kind of thing. And you mentioned sometime the weave and the warp that comes together, the opposites that, yes. make, things, that make things work. I mean, she mentions love in connection to Lowell, but I don't think that's the whole thing, right? No. And I think the genius, like you have said, she was fascinated by him. She only thought of who? Uh, Arndt and Lowell. That's as, right. As the two geniuses. Incredibly original thinkers, because Elizabeth was not. Uh, she, she wrote the one book, Sleepless uh, nights, which was essays about her own life. And she wrote brilliant critical essays, you know, and, but that comes from a different part of the brain, you know, than, than Lowell. And yeah, it was, and everything I've read about him is when he came into a room, there was no one else, mm -hmm. you know, he, he was truly physically, uh, emotionally, mentally, kind of larger than life, and that is the puzzle of uh, uh, of this. Why'd she stay with them? And that is raised in the book. You know, everybody mm -hmm. gossips. Why is she? You know, why is she with him? He's humiliating her, and why would she consider taking him back? And uh, you know, I think uh, see if I got this right. Is it Yates who talked about the crooked? corkscrew of the heart yes it's yeah it, i think that's the answer it's it it's yes of course it's she just there would be no other man for her there really wasn't before and there wasn't she lived decades after he did there wasn't anyone after either well you know it's um it's been said of poetry that it is not the job of the poet to answer the questions, but to ask the right questions. Not necessarily to provide the answers, but ask the right questions. And Robert Frost said, poetry, we don't look to poetry for answers. We look to it for a way through. Mm. Feeling, I mean, your writing is very poetic. It touches very deeply on poetic technique and poetic observation. There's hardly a sentence that is not interesting in some way. Thank you. And so I think that um, maybe the same thing applies. Maybe you raised the right question. Thanks. I hope so. This of all my work, do, I've never believed in anything being channeled. You know, it's too hard to write. I, I, yeah. 
you know, it's not a channel. But I heard, I really heard her voice. I heard Elizabeth's voice and I so admired, uh, you know, I think it was, it was Susan Sontag who said that Hardwick writes the most beautiful sentences in the English language. She was so, you know, she was so articulate and so clear about parsing uh, what was going on. I mean, this great sentence about her essays is that she feels that it's not, you don't write a, a, a criticism or a review, basically, to say if something's good or bad, but to engage, you know, the, the, the mind of the reviewer is engaged with the mind of the, the writer, the creator. And that's, you know, that's what she did. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I have no desire. I, I have no expectation of writing another novel. Too many words. <laughs> I'm going back. I'm going back to oh, it's, um, to it's scripts. Come, it's come to say your message, say your message, and go home, right? Yes. Yes. Good. And you know, maybe on that note, I know we we should open it up and uh, bring in Allison at this point for a little more discussion. Allison, Absolutely. Are you ready to go? Can't hear you. Hey. There, here yeah. I am. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you. It's fascinating to listen to you guys talking about this. I've I also had a lot of questions and um, woman to woman, I guess I wondered, you know, did you try to put yourself in her place? Did you imagine what you would have done um, had you been in her shoes, whether you would have stayed or not? Was that something that you wrestled with a little bit as you were writing? Well, I knew what she did. <laughs> yeah, no, every, yeah. I good. knew that, you know, but that's why I wrote, I wrote the novel as a diary, a, mm -hmm. a fictional diary. Um, maybe I'll just read the, the very first paragraph of it, which sets answers, I think, the question you're asking, Allison. Uh, it's Castine, Maine, which is a little town in Maine where they had a house, uh, and uh, 1977. And this is Elizabeth. It's all in the first person. This is the first page of my manuscript, and I am not certain whether to call the narrator I or she. Mm. Either way, it's me. I am writing this during the two weeks that Cal will be away visiting Caroline, that's the new wife, and her daughters in Ireland. Cal says he will return to New York on September 15th and wants to move back in with me. Seven years has passed since they got the divorce. Okay. He wants to move back in with me into our old apartment on 67th Street across from Central Park. It's where we live for most of the 21 years of our marriage until he left me for Caroline. And then she says, I've already mentioned Cal three times mm. in this short paragraph and Caroline twice and not yet named myself. It's a familiar pattern. I prefer writing about other people. I've never kept a diary. I write for publication. However, in these pages, which I don't plan to show to anyone, I intend mm. to overcome my reticence and reveal the details of my personal life without evasion or censure, without trying to make myself look good, without regard for writing correctly or well. I gain clarity through the process of writing. I need that clarity now. And so that was, you know, I just put myself in that, like, I don't know what to do. Should I take this man back? Right. Uh, and and everybody says no. Right. <laughs> right. You know, and so she's writing her way through to figure out what she should do. I mean, I was fascinated by her character as I read your book and she didn't come across to me as being over. I mean, she loved him deeply, but she was also pragmatic. I mean, she was a woman who managed her own affairs who 
published, who, you know, she was a strong, independent, smart, feisty woman. She was not a pushover in, in your rendering of her at all. And um, yeah, there was something very grounded about her that I liked a lot. Um, she And she wasn't a drama queen. You know, she wasn't self-pitying or, you know, it was a dramatic situation, but she was not dramatizing herself in it or having breakdowns or, I mean, that was all, he was the one who had the breakdowns and she was the one who kind of put things together and kept things going. Yeah, absolutely. And not only that, she took care of all the practical affairs. Right. I mean, she ran the household. He was ha very happy that they had a baby, but he didn't do much about it. Right. <laughs> She, right. he would occasionally take Harriet to the zoo or you know on a, on a boat ride but the fun the stuff diapers, the, the all that you know feeding the, you know all the, the care no I think the only moment you know that I really saw that pain is with the dolphin you know and, mm -hmm. and you know where she says I've never been never been so hurt yeah. Life. And yet, even after that, she somehow found it in her heart to forgive him. And these days, I think uh, somebody would have, you know, she would have sued. I mean, I think a, a 2020 version of her would have taken him to court over that, but she did not. I'm sure that never even occurred to her at all. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is, you know, I, I did it as a short play, a 35 minute play with two brilliant actors. And uh, Judah McNeil, who plays, and we just did it uh, Sunday, you know, at the Magic Theater, who plays uh, Elizabeth, just had the same questions from at the beginning. And as she worked through the script and read the novel, right. you know, she said, I love it because it, it isn't, it, it isn't of this time. Right, you know, very much not. Yes, uh, it, that it isn't that kind of thing. Where you betrayed me, you humiliated me, you know, whatever. That's it. It's over. Right. The sense of sort of I don't know what it is, largesse, forgiveness, awareness that uh, some things transcend that. And you know, the yeah. other key, really, element I think made a, a real difference was the knowledge that. Uh, he was he had heart problems that he had gone through that seven years of separation were very tough on Lowell he right. was in a chaotic environment married to a woman who was as Elizabeth says as crazy as he was mm. so that rock you know that stability of taking care of him uh, she said it was so touching in one of her letters to Mary McCarthy she said you know I think Cal is closer to it looks like we lost um yeah oh there you go Lynn we lost you for a second and I I didn't hear the last thing you said and you're muted now Got to unmute. Can you unmute? Can you there you go. go. Yeah. Am I that? Yeah. I had missed. I missed the last thing you said. Oh, where did you go? She may. She may come. Maybe she'll back out and come back. I'll keep a watch on. I'll okay. Look. Yeah. Yeah. I was. Um, I was so interested in that sentence. Um, he was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I was going to ask Lynn whether that sentence came from a letter that she sent to somebody, or, you know, whether she lifted that out of um, something that Elizabeth Hardwick actually wrote or not. But she's not here, so I can't ask her that. Mm. Um, you know, or whether she projected or imagined that. It is amazing that she stayed or came back or received him again and again. Yeah. Uh, and there, and love, yes, I guess that must be a big part of it. But there was the intellect aspect. There was the the conviviality of the 
intellectually elite that he was a big part of. Uh, almost magical interactions that would happen in salons or in parties or people talking yeah. and forth. And his, um, his furious creativity where he would yeah. do these manic states and write very quickly and so hard on the page that it would tear the page apart as a part of his writing and revise maybe 10 or 15 times, even in the first setting to do yeah. it. I mean, that, that high energy, even though it is, even though it is pathologic, as we think of it in terms of normal psychology, uh, was something magical, uh, was able to put forward all these uh, exceptional pieces of literature. Yeah. Such a rapid period of time. David, are you familiar with Lowell's writing? I, I ordered the, the Dolphin and started to read it in preparation for doing this panel. And I, of course, I had read Skunk Hour and some of his much anthologized poems, but I hadn't really, haven't really done a deep dive into Lowell. And I confess that reading the Dolphin didn't grab me. <laughs> it didn't, it yeah. did, you know, it, it may be um, because have... of, yeah. I had a similar feeling about Lowell. I had I had visited Lowell um, when I first came to poetry, which was you know thirty years ago or so, forty years ago, um, and I and I thought, well, why is he the person mm -hmm. that Sexton and Plath look up to? Right. I thought Sexton and Plath were superior in their poetic. Um, innovations and confessional aspects um, than Lowell was. But I returned to him just now because of this connection we have yeah. about him uh, with Lynn. And I, I decided that I, of his works, I liked this one, which is the um, For the Union Dead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. It's a much later poem and a poem group. And in this book, he, he takes on the more personal. In the previous ones, it's so very formal. He's right. Formal in a literary way, he makes references to previous literary uh, geniuses and so forth. And it, it does have that sort of formality feeling that it's hard to bond with in an emotional sense. And yet this one I, I find is bondable, at least for me. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that would be if you looked at that one, you would have a somewhat different view. Yeah, I'm still working my way through the dolphin. I haven't, you know, totally given up on it, but it didn't, you know, grab me by the collar and make me right. want to stay up late reading it or anything. It, um, it's interesting to read it now, having read Lynn's mm -hmm. book and understanding the circumstances in which it was written. You know, the um, other thing about the differences in time. I mean, he could have been a, accused of plagiarism in that sense. Right. Because he basically lifted the letters and put them in there, but he right. changed them for his best advantage. He would change things to make himself look a little better and her not so good, which was horrible. And then when she confronted him, he said, well, you wouldn't have given me permission. So I used them anyway. <laughs> That's a lame excuse if I ever heard one. Oh, yes. And you know, Ted Hughes did not quite the same thing, but when he he rearranged the poems in Ariel before they were published right. and created, you know, that structure of the, the arc of that book. And a lot of feminist scholars have critiqued him for it because he gave the book a different and he, and the portrait of Sylvia, which of course was all that was going to be left of her, you know, that book is how people know her and and he shaped it um, and he shaped it in a way to emphasize her insanity and not other aspects of her you know it's interesting to me how people take limit um how take issue with and um permit themselves to make changes in other people's work and it it goes all the way back to emily dickinson right right with her long dashes and the editors came along and said, ah, we don't need these. Yeah. And they would get rid of these dashes when they were integral to right. the feeling tone and the rhythm of the poem. You had to stop at a long dash. It's almost like having a spondee, right? Accent, accent. 
it makes you stop. And when you stop, then the mind picks up on what you've just heard and looks at it again in a somewhat different light. And by the time you connect again to the linear, linear aspect of the work, you have a fresher view of what you've just come from. Welcome back. We've been talking. Thank about you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happens. Technology. So what did I miss? Yeah. Well, you know, I had a question about the line, that line that you referenced earlier when you were talking with David, he was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I wondered if you uh, took that from a letter of hers. Did she write that? Did she, did Elizabeth Hardwick write that in a letter or a diary or something? She did. She did. Who did uh, she write it to? A friend. I think maybe to Mary McCarthy probably to Mary McCarthy. And you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because again, you know, we had Sunday night, we did the reading of the play. And at the very end, and this was a reading, in other words, the actors were still on the script, they had memorized the line, still playing with it a little bit. Uh, her last speech is that Elizabeth has in the play is, um, you know, it, what is it? it it's, um, I, yes, I've been warned. People ask me, would I have married him again? Yes, I would. The breakdowns were not everything. And her last line that I had originally was, uh, he was the best thing that ever happened to me. And somehow when we were rehearsing it right before the performance, it felt right to give that line to Lowell. And it was, it's, you know, and so she says the the breakdowns were not, were not everything. And his line is, uh, to her directly is, he's dead, but she's hearing it in her head. You were the best thing that ever happened to me. That gives me goosebumps and chills when you yeah, say that. because I'm that's what she longed to hear. Well, you know, it's like rewriting you know you poets or anything and if as a playwright you have this wonderful flesh and blood brilliant collaborators if they're really lucky and i haven't been with this piece and you it, it's it's like it's inevitable this is what it has to suddenly it clicks mm. you know into place and go yeah of course this is what she has been longing for and hoping that 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 is true am i going i'm losing it again i don't understand what's going on you're okay as far as i'm concerned i can still yes. hear you and see you you're not freezing Hi. right now for okay. me before well, you you froze up there was one thing you just mentioned that made me think of the fact that um people have talked about <clears throat> writing as a universally collaborative occupation mm. in that sense that even if you're writing by yourself you're accessing other writing and other experience oh, of course. and so the performance in the play i mean once the playwright turns it over to the performers right the playwright loses control and what happens is a director or the actors or things like that and then modificate i mean in storytelling if you look at storytelling down through the eons Every time it gets told, it gets changed a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It becomes a little deeper or a little more appropriate for the time, or the language is a little more current. Um, interpretations of sacred literature happen the same way, oftentimes. And so maybe we don't ever write in isolation. No, the, the point is so well taken. And the fact that I think one of the things that drew me so much to uh, Lowell and, and Hardwick was the times they were writing when writing was everything. Mm. You know, and now there's so much product, you know, and because of, um, mm. you know, technology and everything, we're just bombarded. Um, and but at that time, the written word, you know, and what I, was was everything. And so many, I have many quotes uh, from other writers in Divine Madness because that's how those people thought. 
Mm. You know, that was part mm. of, of their everyday thought, the stuff they had read, the fact of what their peers were writing. Uh, and, and yeah, that sense of, of connection, of, 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 of universality. I mean, we used to be able to talk with people about a book, right? A mm. new book would come out, a new novel, a new volume of poetry, and we'd all read it. And uh, these these folks who were in New York at that time, and in Anyato, you know, this hotbed of of uh, in many ways, yeah, <laughs> and a double meaning of like writers, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you have a line about that um, that has to do with, uh, oh, what is it that you said? The uh, libidinous uh, opening and closing of doors or something? I did something like that, yeah. But yes, yeah, artist colonies. And that was, it was like academic conferences, right? Out of town, isn't yeah. that? <laughs> sort of yeah. that, that, same, that same kind of vibe. Well, maybe if any, do you think we, David, we should open it to any questions if anybody yeah. has right. any? Yes, let, let's open for questions and I'll start off with one. And also, I don't know if you did a, a reading yet. A little. Oh, a, a little, little bit, okay. Do. But you could do a little more reading. But my question is also, I'd like to hear about her relationship with Hannah Arendt. I mean, there's some amazing, incredible people in her circles. Uh, so I'd like to know more about that relationship. Well, interestingly, I, I had written a play uh, a number of years ago that I had gotten produced. And um, it was about Hannah Arendt and her relationship with Martin Heidegger. Mm -hmm. And for those, just to review a little bit, Hannah Arendt uh, was uh, uh, gone now, is a brilliant, a Jewish writer, probably best known for her work on um, uh, the Eichmann trial. It's uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem. And her big quote uh, that is quoted all the time is the banality of evil. Mm -hmm. So when she was talking about Eichmann, you know, don't make him a monster. Don't make him one of a kind. He wasn't, you know, it was her take. He was a bureaucrat doing what you know he was asked to do and just sort of separated his emotions you know from that and the parallel is um, is Elizabeth knew Mary McCarthy Mary McCarthy and Hannah Arendt were very very close friends and um, and you know sort of um, Elizabeth didn't quite envy them but she really she respected that friendship you know, of, of the two of them. She, she, um, she felt Mary McCarthy was a great, you know, very good writer, a good novelist, but uh, Hannah Arendt was a genius. Hannah Arendt was the original thinker. And one of the things in the play that is, <laughs> that I came across is she comes into the house, Mary McCarthy's house, and Hannah Arendt is lying on the sofa. And, um, you know, it's, says Mary McCarthy, she's thinking, you know, and I, <laughs> okay. Great, I love that. This is this, this genius. The parallelism is, and, and this was the center of my play, uh, Martin Haidt, Hannah escaped Nazi uh, Austria, Germany. Uh, Heidegger stayed, he became the dean of, of a, uh, one of the major universities. And he joined the, he had to join the Nazi party, he did, so that he could maintain his position, his teaching position. But he did uh, eliminate, you know, not, not kill them, but push them out of the, all the Jews out of the university. And so, yeah, he, 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 never, uh, he never decried or defamed the Nazi party. After, after the war was over, he wanted to have his philosophy books published in the United States so they wouldn't, most of the publishing houses wouldn't consider it because of his past. And Hannah Arendt vouched for him 
and no. you know, yeah, too, because she she said, well, his work is separate from you know the political situation, and also she had had an affair, a passionate affair with him when she was young. He was her mentor. She adored him, and there is a something of a parallel there, you know. Right. Modest. I mean, Lowell was not a Nazi. You know, he did very yeah. things that were deplorable, but he was not a Nazi. And some, and I don't ever know if this is true for Elizabeth, whether she ever made that connection in her own mind. But I would think she would. Own, she was so smart. Right. You know, she'd almost have to. Well, so anyway, that's that's that. That and and I love the gossip about Hannah Arendt that when she entertained, you know, she would she would serve cocktails and then she would, you know, very, very nice Jewish thing of cakes and <laughs> little sweets and, and all of that. So that was that that literary literary circle. And do we forgive? I mean, isn't this the major question? Right. Do we separate the artist? from its work, from his or her work. Could, do right. we think about Woody Allen, just as right. the most recent. Uh, so many, so many, many. Yeah, so I don't know, I'll, I'll ask you two, what do you think about that? What about- Do I forgive? I haven't, I haven't watched a Woody Allen movie since that, all the shit went down. Well, that's not, no, that's not true. That's not true. I haven't watched one without thinking about that. I haven't paid, you know, I've watched on Netflix, I haven't gone because we get Netflix anyway, but I don't, I won't like go to a theater and, um, and I have really conflicted feelings about watching him now. It's very difficult to watch him on screen for me to see him as a character. Um, he's not always a character in his movies. Um, and yet I grew up loving Woody Allen. My father adores him. We grew up on Woody Allen movies. You know, I mean, it was something I did with my dad a lot was go watch Woody Allen movies. And it's really painful to me that, but I'm just like, ew. And, you know, <laughs> I, 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 it's hard. I don't think of myself as a terribly forgiving person. So I think if I were either of those women, I probably, I'm, I'm pretty much of a grudge holder. I'm not proud of that, but that's kind of part of my, who I am. So I think that um, anyone who creates does so probably consciously or unconsciously uh, in a persona. Mm. And uh, when you meet them, which I've done mm. with a lot of really top artists, they're not exactly what I expected. Right. Um, they can be a little more um, conniving. Uh, they can be a little more um, uncomfortable. And whereas in their work, they seem to be totally comfortable. Mm. I mean, even Robert Frost picked fights with his neighbors. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah. He was a grumpy old guy. He's a grumpy old guy. <laughs> Yeah. Wrote these lovely poems. I mean, right. So I think and he wasn't a very good father either, I don't think, right? No, that's right. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of or we, right. we all have faults. And I think writers are no different in that sense. But when we write, I think we somehow aspire to a higher standard. And uh, that comes through in morality mm. as well. And I think that stories are um, inherently moral because they show the consequence of our actions. Mm. In real life, you can walk up to somebody, insult them and walk away and never talk to them again. And you don't see what happens to them afterwards. But if you know, I think, um, um, you know, the gun in the first act mm. fired by the fifth act. So mm. if you introduce something that's angry or hurtful, hurtful or problematic in a major way, something is going to happen in the narrative that shows the consequence of those actions. Right. And that, that's ethics, that's morality. Um, and it's, and it's the story itself that demands that. You know, I know that writers are not any better than anybody else. Um, but I, I don't know if I would give somebody a pass if they were significantly worse, you know, than my, no. you know, people in my, I mean, I know we're all human, we're all, we all have frailties, and yes, writers are often uncomfortable and anxious and insecure and depressive people, so, you know, just 
kind of take that as given, but that's the business, isn't it, of separating right. the writer from his work or her work, because you can, in your mind, condemn the writer mm -hmm. and also love the work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We oh, have a. Yeah, we have a I, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say we have a question in um, from Mr. Sheldon Bacchus. Lynn, by any chance, have you read Dostoevsky's Idiot? Lowell sounds very much like Prince Mishkin. Oh, so long ago. I need to reread it. Tell me how, why? Well, Mr. Bacchus would have to do that. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Bacchus? Bacchus. Where do you see the connection? And, am I coming through OK? Yes. OK. Uh, Prince Mishkin's personality is is very interesting and what I'm kind of focusing on here a little earlier it, 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 actually when you started the discussion we were talking about the difference between the analytic and the intuitive. Mishkin was portrayed by Dostoevsky very interestingly in that uh, he reached some sense of reality in his epileptic fits which in fact forced him completely from reality uh, in the it, but the, the thing was is that it there was somehow that was where the truth was. That was where creativity was uh, was in in the in those seizures. Uh, the essence of things became clear to him, and I I was just wondering to, that it's that's almost archetypic. Uh, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, Rebecca Solnit's uh, just done a novel on uh, uh, actually biography biography on Edward Mybridge. Same thing. <laughs> my bridge, <laughs> my bridge was just the sign of crazy, I think. But again, she was dealing with this issue of here's a, an intensely personal creativity, creative person, yet that creativity isn't realized until somehow that person is divorced from reality. Divine madness. <laughs> wow, yeah. I think that was what David was uh, really discussing early. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. at the beginning and the question is you know from what i've got in my novel and at any rate and what i've read is that it's a thin line like there is a point at which yes it's tremendously your thoughts are free and connecting in ways that in a traditional way you would never come up with and then you just tilt you know, it moves to that, the needle moves to, you know, you think you're Jesus Christ or Mussolini yeah. or, you know, or what you're spouting doesn't make yeah. any sense at all. Um, David, does that make sense to you? Is it, is it kind of, you know, a, a moving, uh, like, a, what, an arc? And it, you, you pass a certain point and it, then it's just chaos. It's very interesting. I, I'm not sure I know enough to really say, although what I have, um, I've done some experiments on myself that have to do with trying exploring um, the deeper consciousness. And I've, I've used the hypnagogic state, mm -hmm. which is that part of life, which is between wakefulness and sleep. Mm -hmm. And um, where I found the richest resource was about 2.30 or three o'clock in the morning when I trained myself to wake up and write, but I would write in the dark without, without actually waking up. And so I, what I envisioned was I would dip down into the unconscious and whatever came up, I would write it down without any kind of correction or editing or, because when we have an editor that governs our work, we bring it into life in a certain way that's up to expectation. But expectation doesn't leave room for creativity because it's what has been done mm. already. And so if you're gonna be creative, you have to be willing to be William Burroughs or you know somebody like that who has the naked lunch and he just rants for about 150 pages. And so in this ranting, there is a, a form of intelligence that is not present in the linear thinking daytime. Mm. And I've actually published two books of poems that come from this source. And um, when I first looked at them myself, I thought they were crazy. Mm. I thought nobody's gonna like these. But it turned out when I would give readings, I would read 
one or two of these poems. And although the audience seemed very quiet, afterwards they would come up and say, I really like that poem. I don't know why, but I, and so I, what I concluded was that their unconscious was not, un, not unlike my own. Mm. Yeah. And probably operating at similar ways than my unconscious. And so, um, yes, I think that the, those folks who suffer from what we label as insanity um, weave in and out of various forms of consciousness all the time. And we just think it's not right because it doesn't match what our consciousness in the moment is. But it is an expression of humanity. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen. Otherwise, it wouldn't be capable. And I guess the real message is how do we use that form of aberrant, quote, unquote, consciousness mm. and incorporate it into our creativity in such a way that we move forward? And Lowell obviously did that. Yeah. He was able to, uh, and there are other examples too of, of that sort of thing. Um, and it often comes in those who are the most distressed in their, in their real life. And there were a number of psychiatrists that I remember in the 60s and 70s uh, who would take patients going through schizophrenic breaks and not and and allow that, allow, mm. you know, that instead of trying to medicate it, you know, so okay. that yeah. it would end or suppress, it has to be in a very protected environment, et cetera. But yeah, there is um yeah, who was uh, Lang? Wasn't it um, R.D. Lang, the Scottish um, yes. psychoanalyst? Or there's also an article in this uh, on the New York Times website right now. There's an article about a woman who's choosing not to medicate her psycho her psychosis. She she hears voices. I think her diagnosis would probably be schizophrenia. And she was heavily medicated for years and it made her gain a ton of weight and just her hands would shake and all these really unpleasant physical symptoms and, and that made her not even want to live. And finally, she decided she would just go off all her meds and live with the voices. And there's a whole movement of people who are classified as mentally ill and who have you know suffered a lot of you know, hear voices and whatever. And they've, they're creating now like safe spaces okay. to, you know, allow people to be who they are, um, crazy, not crazy, to think that they're Mussolini or Jesus or whatever, and, um, and relate on that, relate in that from that place. Well, it's um, very interesting. I think that sometimes real creative, interesting thoughts can come out of those voices. Right. Um, we all hear voices a little bit. I mean, the poets will tell you, we, I don't write the poem, I just hold the pen. Mm. And the poem comes from somewhere I don't even understand. And so we become the channel maybe for thoughts. Now it does come from inside us, but I think what happens is it's different parts of our own consciousness that are speaking to each other. And I can tell you one thing that the unconscious is far more powerful and far bigger and far stronger than the conscious mind. And if I try to revise one of those poems that uh, comes out of this uh, exercise, I get my hand spanked. Yep. So it says, don't touch that poem. It's already been, it's already mm -hmm. been read. I have that uh, in place. And I, actually I had it kind of with this. Somehow okay. I merged with what I'm trying to say and, and leave it alone don't try to make it make more sense mm. you know, or more connect, just leave it alone. And the thing mm. is when people revise, 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 you have to be very careful. Yeah. Sure that you are revising to the in, initial incitive yeah. event or feeling that got it started in the first place and not trying to pretty it up in some way that makes it publishable in the Atlantic. Exactly. Barbara, were you gonna ask something? Yeah, unmute. I was going to say that um, when I was training to be a psychologist, one of my first patients, this was in the late 80s, had schizophrenia. And it was just that they had closed the mental institutions and psychotropic medication was really very much in. 
And when he refused to take the medication, he said, it turns off all the color. Mm. Mm. And so what, what you were saying made so much sense to me about um, just how important for survival is that color and that story. And even he was willing to go through these horrible manic and depressive states and craziness and psychosis because the color was so important. There's a great song in the musical Next to Normal. Mm. Oh. I Miss the Mountains. Exactly. It's a beautiful song. I love that, that song. song. Go on yeah. YouTube. In, basically, it's a woman in deep grief for the loss of a child. And they're trying to help her by medication, and she takes it. And the lyric is, you know, she's gotten rid of the lows, which was horrible depression. But, you know, she misses the highs. She misses the mountains. What do you yeah. mean for the story? Yes, well. that song just, it's just so, per you that, know, David? That, you yeah. Know? There was a, the story of Harvey the rabbit, remember? Yeah. Uh, where the, the Harvey was the companion for this person, the big seven foot rabbit. And when he didn't have the rabbit and was treated, he became morose and depressed. But when he had the rabbit, he was like a, a full, intelligent, interesting person. Oh, my. Yeah. We need our rabbits. We need, yeah. our, rabbits. <laughs> we need our rabbits. Yep. Well, Lord friends, um, it's almost that time. And I, mm -hmm. I want to thank uh, all of you for this rich conversation. And yes, we do need all the colors in our lives uh, to create and uh, to inspire. So I want to thank uh, Lynn Kaufman for her wonderful new book, Divine Madness, and poets, uh, David Watts and um, Alison Luderman. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to seek out their work online. And also I've put Lynn's email in the chat if anyone is interested in purchasing a book to be in touch with Lynn and she can direct you to the publisher and also to other ways, other ways to purchase the book. And I, I wish you all very enjoyable reading uh, throughout the next it's on, I've been summer. interrupting, but it's also the book can be purchased on uh, Barnes and Noble and also on uh, Amazon. And if you want to email me though, that's great. But the book, can, you can get the book. You can actually get the book online. I want to, since I've interrupted, I want to thank you so much, Laura and Pamela, and my two wonderful poets, you know, and everybody who's tuned in for a very soulful conversation. And now it's over to you to end it. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And come back to Mechanics Institute, whether we're on Zoom or live in person at 57 Post Street here in San Francisco. So I wish you all a good night. <laughs>